Ang bante ti sahanena saha pancha silani yachami dutiampi ang bante ti sahanena saha pancha silani yachami tatiampi ang bante ti sahanena saha pancha silani yachami namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa 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 Namo tassa Ato arahato sama sambudasa. Budhang saranam gacchami. Budhang saranam gacchami. Dhammang saranam gacchami. Dhammang saranam gacchami. Sanghang saranam gacchami. Sanghang saranam gacchami. Dutiyampi budhang saranam gacchami. Dutiyampi budang saranam gacchami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranam gacchami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranam gacchami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranam gacchami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranam gacchami. Dutiyampi budang saranam gacchami. Tatiyampi budang saranang gacchami. Tatiyampi damang saranang gacchami. Tatiyampi damang saranang gacchami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranang gacchami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranang gacchami. Di saranang gamanang itang. Amabante. Anatipata vingamana sikha padami samadhyami. Anatipata vingamana sikha padami samadhyami. Adinna dana vingamana sikha padami samadhyami. Adinna dana vingamana sikha padami samadhyami. Kami sumi chachara. Vigamani sikha padam samadhyami. Kame sumi cha chara. Vigamani sikha padam samadhyami. Musavata sikha padam samadhyami. Musavata vigamani sikha padam samadhyami. Surami raya manja pamada. Ana Viramani Sikha Padam Samadhyami. Suha Meraya Maja Pamadatana Viramani Sikha Padam Samadhyami. Imani Pancha Sikha Padani Silena Sukatingyanti Silena Bhoga Sampada Silena Niputingyanti Di tasma silang sudagi. Sadu sadu sadu. Sadu sadu sadu. Sadu sadu sadu. Hundred forty one. Satsa sutta. The exposition of the truths. Thus have I heard. On on occasion, the blessed one was living at Banaras in. Deer Park at Isipatana. There he addressed the vikus thus. Vikus, Venerable Sarate replied. The Blessed One said this. At Benares, vikus in Deer Park at Isipatana, the Tathagata, accomplished and fully enlightened, set rolling the matchless wheel of Dhamma. Note 1288. This refers to Buddha's first sermon delivered to the five bhikkhus in the deer park at Isipatana, which cannot be stopped by any vikkhus or Brahman or God or Mara or Brahma or anyone in the world. That is, 
denouncing, teaching, describing, establishing, revealing, expounding, and exhibiting of the Four Noble Truths. Of what for? The announcing, teaching, describing, establishing, revealing, expounding, and exhibiting of the Noble Truth of Suffering. The announcing, teaching, describing, establishing, revealing, expounding, and exhibiting of the noble truth of the origin of suffering, of the noble truth of cessation of suffering, of the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. At Benares Bhikkhus, in the Deer Park at Isipatana, the Tathagata accomplished a, and fully enlightened, set rolling the matches will of the Dhamma, which cannot be stopped by any recluse or Brahman or God or Mara or Brahma or anyone in the world. That is the announcing, teaching, describing, establishing, revealing, expounding, and exhibiting of these four noble truths. Cultivate the friendship of Sariputta and Moglana because associate with Sariputta and Moglana. They are wise and helpful to their companions in the holy life. Sariputta is like a mother. Moglana is like a nurse. Sariputta trains others for the fruit of supreme entry. Moglana for the supreme goal. Note 1289. M.A. Venerable Sariputta trains them until he knows they have attained the fruit of stream entry. Then he lets them uh, develop the higher paths on their own and he takes on a new batch of pupils. But Venerable Moglana continues to train his pupils until they have attained Arahantship. Sariputta Bhikkhus is able to announce, teach, describe, establish, reveal, expound, and exhibit the four noble truths. So the Blessed One said, Having said this, the Sublime One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling. Soon after the Blessed One had gone, the Venerable Sariputta addressed the Bhikkhus thus, Friends, Bhikkhus, friend, the Bhikkhus replied to the Venerable Sariputta. The Venerable Sariputta said this, At Benares, friends, in the deer park at Isapatana, the Tathagata, accomplished and fully enlightened, set rolling the matchless wheel of the Dhamma, and exhibiting of the four noble truths, of what for? The announcing and exhibiting of the noble truth of suffering, of the noble truth of the origin of suffering, of the noble truth of the cessation of suffering, of the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. And what, friends, is the noble truth of suffering? Earth is suffering, aging is suffering, death is suffering, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair are suffering. Not to obtain what one wants is suffering. In short, the five aggregates affected by clinging are suffering. Um, before I read, Bhante, I have a question about Sariputta and Mogalana, about uh, how they teach thought differently. Like, um, I mean... It's uh, I'm a little bit uh, ashamed to ask, but uh, is it possible that uh, Sariputta couldn't, um, or why didn't he um, teach um, his students to uh, attain higher paths and fruits? And uh, why why did Mogalana do that? Well, it would, it... it would mean he'd have to spend his time on those students. I think it's more about. Uh, teaching more students. They had a lot of students, so maybe Sariputta sent his students to continue with Moggallana, although here it says he just left them to practice on their own. It meant he could spend his time with, with new students instead. It's the most efficient way, like once you become a Sotapanna, that's it. I mean, you don't need to do a lot after that. The, the person is uh, going to attain enlightenment uh, within a max of seven lives, so once you get somebody over that hurdle, you can uh, take on a new batch of students and not uh, spend time on that person because that person is already saved. So it is said that uh, Sariput had the highest wisdom, right? The first chief of disciples of the Buddha. So I thought that uh, he only, I mean, 
it's probably very hard to attain uh, Sotapanna, but now uh, in the note, uh, it didn't say that Mogala- Mogalana students weren't. So I, I thought the same, like Sariputta would lead students up until they attained Sotapanna, and then uh, maybe Mogalana took over, but that's not the case. That may be oh, the case. It doesn't really make clear here what exactly they do. It would make sense if they did it that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, then, uh, then, then Venerable Mugalana would take over after uh, they become Sotapanna. I think that is what the Sutta is saying. Okay. I mean, if you think about it pra- in practical, ter- practical terms, uh, that's the most... Uh, I mean, you can make many people enlightened if you follow that way. Like, once a person is Sotapanna, it's just... Uh, you, are, you have already entered the stream. Nothing much to do. Uh, so I, I mean, I know that uh, Sariputta didn't really um, use supernormal powers, or I don't know if if he uh, were w- was practicing the jhanas at all. Uh, I I thought that 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 there is a connection. Uh, he had uh, the jhanas, but he, he he was not the foremost like Venerable Mogalla. Mm-hmm. So it's curious here. Just a second. Oh, I see. Yeah, so he's quoting the commentary. You know, to read the commentary. Yeah, the commentary actually goes into a little more detail about the, the, the distinction. And what, friends, is birth? Note 12, 19, 19. The definitions of birth, aging, and death are also found at Majjhima Nikaya 9.22. 26. This entire detailed analysis of the Four Noble Truths is included in the Mahasatihana Sutta with an even more elaborate exposition of the Second and Third Truths. See Diganikaya 22.18 to 21. The birth of beings into the various orders of beings, their coming to birth, precipitation in a womb, generation, the manifestation of the aggregate, obtaining the basis of contact, this is called birth. And what, friends, is aging? The aging of beings in the various orders of beings, their old age, brokenness of teeth, grayness of hair, wrinkling of skin, decline of life, weakness of faculties, this is called aging. And what, friends, is death? The passing of beings out of the various orders of beings, their passing away, dissolution, disappearance, dying, completion of time, dissolution of aggregates, laying down of the body, this is called death. And what, friends, is sorrow? The sorrow, sorrowing, sorrow, inner soreness of one who has encountered some misfortune or is affected by some painful state. This is called sorrow. And what, friends, is lamentation? The wail and lament, wailing and lamenting. The wailing and lamentation of one who has encountered some misfortune or is affected by some painful state. This is called lamentation. And what? Friends is pain, bodily pain, bodily discomfort, painful, uncomfortable feeling born of bodily contact. This is called pain. And what, friends, is grief, mental pain, mental discomfort, painful, uncomfortable feeling born of mental contact? This is called grief. And what, friends, is despair, the trouble and despair, tribulation, the tribulation and desper- desperation? of one who has encountered some misfortune or is affected by some painful state, this is called despair. And what, friends, is not to obtain what one wants is suffering? <clears throat> to being subject to birth, there comes the wish. Oh, that we were not subject to birth. The birth do not come to us, but this, but this is not to be obtained by wishing. And not to obtain what one wants is suffering. To being subject of aging, subject of sickness, subject of death, subject to sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. There comes the wish, oh, that we were not ob- we were not subject to sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. The sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair would not come to us. But this is not to be obtained by wishing, 
and not to obtain what one wants is suffering. And what, friends, are the five aggregates affected by clinging that, in short, are suffering? They are the material form aggregate affected by clinging, the feeling aggregate, the feeling aggregate affected by clinging, <clears throat> the perception aggregate affected by clinging, the formations aggregate affected by clinging, and the consciousness ag aggregate affected by clinging. These are the five aggregates affected by clinging that in short are suffering. This is called the noble truth of suffering. And what, friends, is the noble truth of the origin of suffering? It is craving, which brings renewal of being, is accompanied by delight and lust, and delights in this and that, that is craving for sensual pleasures, craving for being and craving for non-being. This is called the noble truth of the origin of suffering. And what, friends, is the noble truth of the cessation of suffering? It is the remain, remainderless, fading away and ceasing, the giving up, relinquishing, letting go, and rejecting of that same craving. This is called the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. And what, friends, is the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering? It is just this noble eightfold path, that is, right weave, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And what, friends, is right view? Knowledge of suffering, knowledge of the origin of suffering, knowledge of the cessation of suffering, and knowledge of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. This is called right view. And what, friends, is right intention? Intention of renunciation, intention of non-ill will, and intention of non-cruelty. This is called right intention. And what, friends, is right speech? Abstaining from false speech, abstaining from malicious speech, abstaining from harsh speech, and abstaining from idle terror. This is called right speech. And what, friends, is right action? Abstaining from killing living beings, abstaining from taking what is not given, and abstaining from misconduct in senseless pleasures. This is called right action. And what, friends, is right livelihood? Here, a noble disciple, having abandoned wrong livelihood, earns his living by right li livelihood. This is called right livelihood. And what, friends, is right effort? Here, a bhikkhu awakens zeal for the non-arising of unarisen evil, unwholesome states, and he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and strives. He awakens zeal for the abandoning of arisen evil, unwholesome states, and he makes effort arouses energy, exerts his mind, and strives. He awakens zeal for the arising of unarisen, unwholesome, unarisen, wholesome states, and he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and strives. He awakens zeal for the continuance, non-disappearance, strengthening, increase, and fulfillment by development of unarisen, wholesome states, and he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and strives. This is called right effort. And what, <clears throat> friend, is the right mindfulness? Here, Vikhu abides contemplating the body as a body, ardent, fully aware, and mindful. Having put away covetousness and grief for the world, he abides contemplating feelings as feeling, ardent, fully aware, and mindful. Having put away covetousness and grief for the world, he abides contemplating mind as mind, ardent, fully aware, and mindful. Having put away covetousness and grief for the world, he abides contemplating mind objects at mind objects, ardent, fully aware, and mindful. Having put away covetousness and grief for the world, this is called right mindfulness. And what, friends, is right concentration? Here, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. With a stilling and applied and sustained thought, he enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind, without applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of concentration. With a fading away as well of rapture, he abides in equanimity and mindful and fully aware Still feeling pleasure within with the body, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce. He has a pleasant abiding, who has equanimity and is mindful. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, 
he enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. This is called right concentration. This is called the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. At Banaras, friends, in the deer park at Isipatana, the Tathagata, accomplished and fully enlightened, set rolling the matchless wheel of the Dhamma, which cannot be stopped by any recluse of Brahman or God or Mara or Brahma or anyone in the world. That is, the announcing, teaching, describing, establishing, revealing, expounding and exhibiting of the four noble truths. This is what the Venerable Sariputta said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Venerable Sariputta's word. <laughs> Just a small note, the exhibiting is probably better translated as something like make clear. All of those words don't really have any strong significance. They're just different ways of saying the same thing or, or elaborating upon the idea of what the Buddha does. I wouldn't read too much into them. And, but exhibiting is a bit odd and it doesn't really mean exhibiting. It means making clear which isn't quite the same as exhibiting, making making manifest, making obvious, revealing kind of thing. Like when you bring something to the surface that was submerged deep in the water, you make it, bring it forth. The um, topic here is uh, a, good, a good source of more information about the Eightfold Noble Path, the Four Noble Truths, is the Mahasi Sayadaw's discourse on the or book on on the disc the first discourse, the greater discourse on the turning of the wheel of the Dhamma by Mahasi Sayadaw is really good uh, extrapolation and teaching on these these topics. He goes into detail with each one of the points in suffering and all the different kinds of suffering there are. And he explains in detail the cause and the cessation, which are often very quickly passed over because it's quite a short uh, description, uh, quite simple, brief description of the cause and the cessation. But the Mahasi Sayada goes into detail about them. It would be really, be really valuable to read if you haven't read it already. Sorry, can you repeat the name of the book, Parte? Greater discourse on the turning of the wheel of the Dhamma. Is it is it similar to the dependent origination? You mean the book? Yes, the from Mahasi. Well, it's by the same author. I mean, I read several from Mahasi, but I I didn't read this. Does anyone have a question related to the sutta, please? Something that is unclear. I was just wondering about right concentration in this regard has been mentioned in terms of the jhana and uh, I was just maybe extrapolating from there thinking that one is at the moment of mindfulness uh, there is maybe absence of hindrances and that is equivalent to right concentration in terms of momentary concentration something like that well this the eightfold noble path is the moment of attainment of enlightenment so it's a different state and it is in the jhanas Okay. okay. So you, you, if you develop the, the jhanas in advance, it's not right concentration because right concentration has to be accompanied with all of the other seven factors, and that's at, only happens at the moment of enlightenment. So there's two ways of going about it. You can practice samatha meditation first, and then develop the insight necessary to see clearly, or you can practice to see clearly, and uh, as you see clearly, the, the concentration develops anyway. To the point where there's the entering into the jhana at the moment of enlightenment. When one is practicing, and let's say intensively or even just regularly, uh, regularly, and uh, isn't one already fulfilling the eightfold noble path in a way? Because I don't really understand why wouldn't you if you practice correctly. Well, because it's not technically that which leads to the cessation of suffering. The only thing that technically leads to that is the moment of enlightenment. Up until that point, it's it's called it's it's called something. It's called the pubanga manga, the preliminary path. It's not noble because you can fall away from it. 
it can stop and it's mixed. It's only momentary. It comes and it goes. And uh, related to that, would an enlightened being uh, stop practicing uh, Sotapanna, for example? Sure, they might. They I stop thought, forever. Yeah, I thought that they have like like so such a strong inclination that they would would not be able to stop. No, it's not very strong. Mm, okay. So then how about the uh, Saka Dagami? Well, be a lot stronger. Mm-hmm. There was a story of a Sotapan uh, woman who uh, uh, saw a hunter who was selling a meat uh, in the street and then she fell in love and she eloped with uh, him uh, without the permission of the parents. So you can uh, imagine that they are not uh, above, uh, I mean, sensual desire. So these things can distract them and it can go all the way up to like seven uh, lives. Otherwise, if they dedicate themselves uh, to spiritual development, uh, it wouldn't take that long. I have a question on right view. The knowledge of suffering, mm-hmm. is it accurate to say that most people, like a lot of people, they don't even realize that they're suffering? And it's it's already attainment just to come to that conclusion. Yeah, well, that's a big part of what this all means is that you have to face and appreciate that clinging to experiences is cause for suffering. Um, because basically, I basically the important idea is that the things that you thought were worth clinging to are not worth clinging to. So seeing that is what leads you to let go. But the the the, the enlightening uh, experience is to see that nothing is worth clinging to, and it's it's by extrapolation. It's because if you say, "Well, nothing is worth clinging to," well, how do you know? Because you haven't experienced everything. So by ex- it's by extrapolation. It means it gets to the point where you realize you 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 could say you believe without knowing for sure because I mean intellectually you don't know for sure because you haven't experienced everything but you just get it you get it and in fact you get it as a principle based on the nature of reality you say oh the na- reality is like this it's not possible that anything could be worth clinging to and it's this isn't an intellectual thing that goes on in your head but it's an intellectual explanation there's this theoretical explanation of, of what, what happens it's not that you experience everything and see that everything is worth, oh yes, I've experienced everything and none of it's worth clinging to. It's the extrapolative sort of reasoning, not reasoning, but the, the getting it, just the epiphany, the, the release, where you just let go. You lose the desire to cling to anything, just seeing how, how much clinging causes suffering explicitly there are the, speaking of uh, right view of samaditi there are two levels of samaditi one is called dasavastuka uh, samaditi uh, or kamasakata samaditi which is basically uh, your right view on your actions like karma uh, knowledge of karma so that is the first level and the one that leads to enlightenment is the Chatusacha uh, Samaditi, which is uh, right view on the Four Noble Truths. If I may ask, it's two questions about the, the texts themselves, so it's not directly related to the sutta. Is this a good time to ask those questions? Sure, sure. If we don't have questions about the sutta, let's just ask uh, normal questions. Okay, um, the first one is, I was wondering, M-A, what that means. So when we read the notes, it has like M-A, and then it follows um, in um, capital letters. What does that mean? Majima Atakata is the commentary. Okay, so that would answer my second question, because I was wondering what, when you refer to, let's see what the commentary says, I wasn't sure 
where that information, like how you get that information, like where it comes from. So is it that then? It's what follows in the notes and it says MA? Well, the notes come from the commentary. The commentary is just the Pali text that uh, explains the, the sutta. So it's every time we see, like, say, um, 1290, and then we read those notes, that's all commentary? That's Yes, that's pieces of the commentary. I mean, that's oh. his, his, yeah, yeah, that's a, his translation of a piece of the commentary. Sometimes he'll, he'll, instead of putting it like that, he'll say, M.A. says, and then he'll paraphrase, which isn't always exactly what it says, but, um, you know, he's pretty good. He does a good job with that. It's great that it's, it's you never see this anywhere else in a translation where someone does this. It's really great, actually, that he uh, it's, he, he brings so much of the commentary into it, which is great. And it's not it's not to say that the commentary you always have to follow. Some people will criticize it and say they don't agree with what the commentary says or something. So it, you don't have to a hundred percent agree with what the commentary says, but it's it's you're not going to find a more valuable source of of authentic uh, explanation, commentary is your best source, even if it might not be always perfect. I'm not saying that it's not perfect, but I think it probably isn't entirely perfect. And is the commentary, is it the, is it like it's translated by a Bhikkhu Nanamoli and Bhikkhu Bodhi? The commentaries Would they be... haven't really ever been translated. Their pieces have been translated, but. Nobody's ever done a complete English translation. So the commentary, it's not those people, it's other people? No, no, it's ancient, it's, yeah. Oh, okay. No name, no name, monks. Oh. Probably arahants. So are his commentary a separate book from uh, his Sutta Pitaka? Or it's, within the Sutta Pitaka, there's a commentary there? The commentaries are coming from... Uh... Venerable Buddha no, I'm not asking where it's coming from in the book, right? In the, let's say you go in the Sutta Pitaka. Are the commentaries within the Sutta Pitaka or there's a separate book? Uh, well, they're just names. The word Sutta Pitaka doesn't refer to the commentaries. It refers to the, I mean, usually refers to just the canonical text. And you have the commentary to the Sutta Pitaka or the different commentaries to parts of the Sutta Pitaka because they're different texts. It's not one commentary to the whole Sutta Pitaka. There's different commentaries, and they seem to be by different authors, some of them. So those are separate books, right? They are not on the same book. Uh, that uh, I'm talking about in terms of documentation. Well, they're, they're not books oh, in the first that? place. I mean, books are a modern thing, but they're texts. Right. Exactly. No, no, my, my question was in terms of organization after documentation, right? How it is organized, right? I can understand how Sutta Pitaka is organized, but are there... Addendum to the commentaries are addendum to the, uh, or they are in the separate uh, text, separate, separated from the, like, you know, Pitaka. Yeah, they're not usually in the same text. And how then, who then, like, you know, were able to correlate that, or oh, this commentary is for this, or is this a guess? Well, it says what it is. It says it's the commentary of the Majimanikaya or so. I mean, it's not like you just find these in a store or something. These were, these were, they were in fact um, kept together, as we understand. They weren't they weren't kept in separate locations, and then you have to say, "Oh, what what is this a commentary for?" There are also uh, sub commentaries called tika, and the commentary is not uh, giving enough information. There. You can also go to the tikas. Yeah, and those would have been even later, of course, when they've been written about the commentaries. It's uh, probably very similar to what we are seeing here in the modern times, like a note to this passage and so on like they they would put a like a label right that this passage from this sutta and this is the meaning or right well i mean not it's sort of there's a different it would be a different text it would have been someone wrote it out on palm leaves or whatever medium and they would they would take a word in the in the sutta and they would explain that word and then they would take another word and they would explain that <laughs> phrase and that would be their commentary on that sutta. They would write a whole text on, on all of the sut each of the suttas. I, uh, um, today, uh, in Abhidhamma class, um, uh, Charanapali mentioned that we are only like basically scratching the surface of the 
whole Abhidhamma text. And I was wondering if if uh, if you want to know like how much more deep it goes. Like, can you give me just one example that uh, because I only studied this this uh, on this level in the, on this surface level basically. So how much more deep it can go? I don't know. I I don't think of it as as an intellectual thing. It's just it's a profound description of reality. As I said, I think the Abhidhamma is best. You just listen to it and you hear reality and you, mm-hmm. you appreciate that this is real. Remember, practice is about simplifying. Don't try to trivialize how profound the Abhidhamma is. It's more just the profundity of reality. Well, I'm just I'm just correlating. Like uh, we started out with uh, in physics in mechanics, right? And uh, and we are like it's so much more I would say complex if we if we now learned about uh, quantum physics or probabilities and probability fields and waves. So I'm yeah, just yeah. But again, I don't think it's so much about the intellect. I mean, you can study the Abhidhamma intellectually, but it's um, it's just a description of reality. Mm-hmm. You're not going to understand it unless you see seen it, right? Well, you can understand it intellectually, and then there's a lot. If you try to intellectualize and, and analyze and describe and explain the long process, I think there's nine levels of Abhidhamma study in Thailand. Hmm. To the Patana level, your brain is brain cells will start to melt. <laughs> so complicated. It's just a I lot. Imagine that this Abhidhamma is like an expanded version of the summary the Buddha gave to Venerable Sariputta, like uh, the original teaching, how much more it would have been. But uh, I, I thought the Abhidhamma was not, uh, it was the later manifestation, right? It was, I mean, in the, in the first uh, uh, Buddhist conference, the Abhidhamma was not uh, there, right? Only uh, Sutta Pitaka and uh, no, it yeah. wasn't written down. It wasn't written down. It has been passed down. No. Yeah, written, people. written, written from uh, started one starting from fourth conference, right? I'm not talking about written. Even in first uh, conference, it was not uh, uh, recited or right. Uh, they they only yes, like uh, yes, put they, together. On, yeah, what, what we're told is that yes, it was recited. Yeah. I thought, and we learned that, Amar, that it was recited. It, oh, it just it wasn't separated. separated out like that. Like, this is the sutta, this is a... It wasn't yet, like, put in three baskets, right? But the whole thing was recited. Okay. I... I Okay, I... I yeah. <laughs> Wrong info. I thought, like, uh, it was after the, like, you know... Um, the monks put, put together this, uh, this Abhidhamma later, right? No, uh, the suttas were written down uh, before the Abhidhamma. But it, uh, the writing down process happened much later after the Parinibbana of the Buddha in Sri Lanka. So it doesn't matter. Like There was already a huge gap uh, by the time they were writing down. So if one is arguing, okay, Abhidhamma was written down later than the suttas, it's it's not much to uh, go on because everything we have right now uh, was written down much later. Anyway, it's a matter of are you trusting what the monks uh, wrote down and are you trusting the Buddhist councils? Bhante, I have a question. Um, ignorance and craving is the reason why we're here, right? Um, I wonder this concept, this concept of ignorance and craving has a source. Uh, ignorance of the Four Noble Truths, not just craving. Ignorance of the cause of suffering, but also ignorance of suffering. I just wonder if, uh, yeah, if uh, there is a cause why we we are ignorant and why we are craving for. For this. Well, the cause is technically the hindrances, but you don't need a cause for ignorance. 
you don't you can't start out knowing something you have to start out not knowing something right it doesn't need a cause per se but the the, the the text will say the cause is the hindrances but that's just what keeps us ignorant that's not what makes ignorance arise ignorance isn't the thing that arises it's the absence of knowledge it's like uh, what what is what what happens so that you don't know uh, the Pythagorean theorem? Well, if you never heard it, then you didn't need a reason. It didn't happen because of something. You just never heard it. Related to my earlier question about uh, how uh, I thought that a sotapanna would not let go of practice, for example, or something. So, is it? Possible that, for example, Putujana has like a stronger inclination to practice and doesn't give up, and and then uh, Sotapanna does. Like, is there like such a big difference? Well, no. I mean, the Sotapanna and uh, Putujana can also give up very easily, much more easily, much more easily. But that's just human nature. People have a hard time sticking with something continuously. They change, they go through cycles, they get sidetracked by life and work and so on. So just becoming a Sotapanna doesn't make you immune from that. It, it, it dulls it or it weakens it. And so they'll always come back to it, but they're still prone to the same thing that, I mean, that would have happened much more radically if they were just still a Putujana. And we just get distracted by things. This reminds me of the analogy the Buddha gave once. He took some, I think, dirt to his hand and uh, compared the amount of suffering a Sotapanna has to uh, experience uh, to that amount and the suffering he has uh, discarded to the soil of the entire earth. So Putujana still has that amount of suffering compared to a sotapanna. And something that can distract you is the, or or what, what you're getting at, I think, is can still uh, lead you astray is the complacency based on the, the peace and the happiness that comes from becoming a sotapanna. There's such great peace and happiness that you feel content it's a great contentment mm. that can uh, slow you down so yeah i mean I, I shouldn't have been so dismissive certainly that that's a thing it's not really that concerning it's it's valid that there is a great peace and contentment. But it does mean it can take some time to go deeper, to go further, because you've gotten caught up in the happiness and you can just live a peaceful life, much more peaceful than before. So the, what you're describing, the urgency is has left to some extent. Mm -hmm. But what I was trying to say, I guess, is that that's that's just ordinary people. That's what when there is something glaringly painful, then we get up and do the work. And when the obvious things are gone, we don't have the depth to appreciate the more subtle issues. Yeah, I guess that's what I'm. Uh, I don't want to say that. Uh, seeing or something like uh, but yeah it it seems like when people are not yet uh, let's say I mean not that I know but uh, uh, when they are not there yet right like they they are still a putujana they know that that they are suffering and they are in this uh, mess then it looks like they are putting in a lot more effort a lot, lot more effort it can be. It's not, of course, always the case. Because two things: first of all, the uh, they, they they've got something to do that a sotapanna doesn't have to do any longer, and that's see the four noble truths. And um, 
second, mm -hmm. the the effort that a sotapanna puts out is a lot less, um, a lot less panicked, or a lot less uh, strenuous, I guess. Sotapanna can put out an easier effort because their minds are so much more peaceful, relatively speaking. Some some sotapanna, of course, do work diligently, but it's not as feverish. It's not as uh, not as stressful. Yeah, it clears up uh, all of my questions, Vante. Thank you. Just uh, inquisitive, but uh, will the Sotapanna or even Sakadvat Bhami know that they have experienced environment in their second birth? Or, yeah. No, I mean, it, it, that's just an intellectual thing to know that you've experienced something, right? They would be conscious of the state of mind. Someone who is a Sotapanna is conscious of the state of mind and more conscious than a Putujana who doesn't really necessarily have any sense of anything about themselves. They may have very little understanding of how they, they, who they are, what they are, and what they're like. But a Sotapanna has greater clarity and so they'll, they'll understand their nature of their mind, their inability to kill. They would have a, They would have an innate sense of not being able to kill or steal or lie, cheat. Even when they are uh, in, in their second life, he, he, the moment they hear about what the Sotapanna is, like what qualities the Sotapanna has, then they got to know, okay, this is me. This is They're talking about me for my qualities. Might not know by label, by, by name. But uh, once they hear the Dhamma, they would know that they're talking about uh, what they have. Uh, but uh, immediately after the path and fusion attainment, uh, there is a reviewing process, right? So isn't that, uh, that would review the Nibbana as an, as an object? Um, like would make it clear to a sotapanna that they did attain sotapanna path. Well, those are just words. They they wouldn't have a an idea of this word sotapanna necessarily. They would have. They would know that some, They would know what happened. They would have some clarity about what happened. Yes, that's what I mean. For example, Vishaka attained Sotapan at the age of seven, I believe. So she would know not what it was, but it was cold. She just heard the sermon and then attained that level. Exactly. So you don't you don't really have a name for it uh, ever. I think that whenever you experience an, uh, I would say inside only only if you start thinking about it and. If you know the concepts uh, associated with that, that specific experience, no, you wouldn't be able to describe it. When Bante said about contentment, what do you, what exactly, the, uh, what I mean is, content, what uh, can you please describe uh, with the meaning, of, the true meaning of contentment? Well, there's two kinds of contentment. You can be content with uh, content with results, and you can be content with actions. So you can be content with results means you don't discriminate between pain or pleasure, or you don't wish for certain things and uh, try to avoid any other thing. So contentment is is with results, is whatever you, whatever you get, you're okay with it. And then contentment with actions is you're okay with 
greed, okay with anger, okay with delusion, you're okay with bad karma and so on. Um, but what, what that result, what that translates into for meditators is you're okay with being lazy. You're content in terms of you're content in what you've done. You're content in terms of not not putting out effort to do more, to to continue. And so that's a bad. Mm-hmm. That's not a good contentment. But wholesome contentment is contentment with uh, with results, not expecting for this or that. You, you don't Sorry. need um, you don't need to manipulate you don't need to do anything and let it be like that no no the point is you do need to do something so the buddha talked about the importance of discontent you shouldn't be content in regards to uh, in regards to wholesomeness you shouldn't be content with with letting it be Per se, I mean, mindfulness is very much about letting it be, but that's that takes work. There's effort involved with that. Yeah. Thank you, Bhante. Santuti Bahulo. The Buddha said, to be great, you have to be full of discontent. Have a good week, everyone. Sadhu. 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 Thank you. Sadhu. Thank you, Sadhu. Thank you, Sadhu.